Kia ora, talofa, haere mai, and welcome to this week's episode of the Niche Cast. We are from the Niche Cache, the niche-cache.com, where you will find ample Aotearoa sporting yarns, fresh. I'm going to redo that uh, Simon Keen fresh on the scene. I'm hearing Hoochie screaming bit that uh, got a bit weird in the variety show. Fresh on the scene on the website, we've got a Warriors diary entry. I wrote about the Warriors versus the Storm, previewing that. The Wildcard's done a bit of a deep dive into the Wellington Phoenix and their run of form, both of which we're going to talk about on this podcast. So if those tickle your fancy, make sure you head on over to our website, theniche-cache.com, and read all about it. There is a preview yarn to the Memphis, Minnesota NBA series of which Stephen Adams is also playing. So we're going to touch on those three topics for today's podcast all of which you can read about on the website right now. There's also a big old Flying Kiwis yarn. I put the Kiwi NRL spotlight on Jordan Rickey, Brisbane Broncos forward from Christchurch. There's lots of uh, previous yarns to enjoy as well, especially like some cricket stuff wrapping up the summer. Got the Plunkett Shield All-Stars, got the Fresh and Funky Lads, all sorts of Aotearoa sporting content that uh, provide a bit of insight help you learn help us to learn and just uh, get into the depths of Aotearoa sport sporting matters so check it out the niche-case.com also pick it up to the patreon whānau there is a fresh cricketing podcast on the patreon feed so make sure you're checking that out and patreon is a great way to support the niche case and our content and our mission to broadcast Aotearoa sporting excellence in the fresh and funky matter similar to those Plunkett Shield lads we're doing that without the bat and ball. We're doing that with the keyboard and our eyeballs watching sport, learning. So that Patreon podcast, lots of big old black caps yarns, uh, touching on Will Young and Matt Henry and county championship cricket coming up, as well as the IPL lads, all of which is ahead of Aotearoa Black Caps going to England for three tests where they will win 3 0, and England cricket will continue to. Let's go with uh, slide down the shitter. Monday and Friday is also our email banger um, dispatch via Substack. So patreon.com forward slash our niche cache. That's in the, in the description to all these podcasts as well as the Substack email sign up, the niche case dot substack dot com. And then every Monday and Friday, you basically get sent all the niche cache content straight to your email. But it's also a great way to you know, touch base with some Aotearoa sporting matters. Sometimes we might refer to some mainstream media sporting matters and poke fun at those. Sometimes we might get deep into the into the mangroves and just uh, explore some ideas. Sign up every Monday and Friday evening. Aotearoa sporting content delivered straight to you. Easy mahi. Easy mahi. And we always start our podcast with a dose of mindfulness just to set the vibe right. Turn the oven on. Let's start cooking like English cricket wildcard with a dose of mindfulness. Indeed. Um, yeah, let's, let's go with this one from Mr. William Butler Yates, who is, I would say, probably my favorite poet, who said, the world is full of magic things patiently waiting for our senses to grow sharper. The world is full of magic things patiently waiting for us to... For our senses to grow sharper. For our senses to grow sharper. So it's basically saying there's uh, lots of magical things that already exist in this world, but it's just up to us to, for our senses to grow sharper, for us to grow, for us to um, develop and ascend as human beings, <clears throat> which, wildcard, requires patience in itself so it's like the magical elements of the world are displaying patience waiting for us and we need to display patience as well in return it's kind of a two-way street there what do you reckon yeah i reckon that's pretty spot on um yeah like their patience is in um in response to our patients like yeah they they have to be patient because we have to be patient which forces them to be patient but they can be patient because they're magical things waiting for whatever that means like whatever that 
um, might refer to. Um, I mean, like nature isn't really bound by the same uh, limitations of time as as humans either. So that's fine. They're like natural wonders can just wait um, for us to to discover them to to up skill to to increase to like improve our tools to the um point i mean it's a it's a it's a question of perception really that that quote um and i just i just like that idea of like the um believe the word is preternatural like a supernatural right which is stuff that happens beyond um nature then there's natural which is obvious thing and then somewhere in between that there's like the preternatural um and the preternatural is like um things that occur naturally but which we don't have the perception of them the knowledge of them or maybe the um the ability to fit them within our like uh framework of what we think the world is so um like i guess as an example if you consider like trying to explain i don't know like infrared light to someone from the middle ages you know what i mean it would sound like magic to them but our us in this day and age we can explain that scientifically so you just think like well okay let's wait like six seven hundred more years what will those people be able to explain scientifically that to us would feel like magic right that that kind of idea yeah you kind of just took that mindfulness and injected it with steroids so we'll uh <laughs> back a bit and we'll get a li little less uh interdimensional there um but i i was thinking shout out to nature's patience because nature sure. is only patient like right like I find it funny that many of the issues facing nature stem from humanity's lack of patience, whereas nature's got all the patience. So I don't know, maybe we should learn from nature, but let's keep it moving because you did enter the realms of blown minds there. And uh, <laughs> right. I think we I think we just need to like take a deep breath after that one because I don't know what the fuck you just said and I'm sure the listener doesn't, but we'll keep learning, we'll keep growing and I'm sure you'll... Uh, enlighten us further but wildcard i can actually i was going to do this as like a funny bit but i think what you just explained there with uh, your mindfulness on steroids perhaps alludes to this because i can sense energies and i can sense that right now you're a uh, you're a caged animal with regards to Aotearoa's uh, Stephen Adams. I can sense that there is uh, a lot of, there are some differing opinions on Stephen Adams and his role with the Memphis Grizzlies. But as the bloke, as the one person in this world who has tracked Stephen Adams over the course of his NBA career in the depth that you have, I think you know some of the truths about Stephen Adams and what he's doing at the Memphis Grizzlies, whereas everyone else in this NBA playoff situation is just tripping over immediate reactions. So I'm kind of, I just want to keep the reins on you here. I just want to, I don't want to unleash you into a tirade of uh, fuck everyone else, it's Stephen Adams till I die, that type of stuff. Um, we're just going to stay mellow and I just want to present some things what we know about Stephen Adams right now. First thing is we know that Stephen Adams versus Carl Anthony Towns was a bad matchup for Stephen Adams. In the same way that Dan Hooker fighting Islam Makachev in the UFC is a bad matchup for Dan Hooker because Islam Makachev takes him down within a couple of minutes and it's fight over, right? Like these matters, especially when you're looking at um, boxing and uh, UFC and these one out sports, it's all about the matchup. If you're a striker going up against a wrestler, it's going to be tricky. Those type of things. And we know, you told us, we read about it. We discussed it. We know Stephen Adams versus Carl Anthony Towns is a bad matchup for Stephen Adams. And we also know, as discussed, again, on the podcast, reading about it, Minnesota have uh, defeated Memphis Grizzlies more than... The other way around. I think it was 3 1, maybe during the season. Well, Stephen Adams didn't play uh, one game. Two all, it was 2 all during the season. But Stephen um, Adams, didn't Adams play did one game. miss one of those games. Yeah. yeah. So we also know that Minnesota Timberwolves have provided a 
niggly matchup against the Memphis Grizzlies. Boil it down further. Stephen Adams and Carl Anthony Towns, that's a bad matchup for old Steve. We also know as a fact that Stephen Adams is a team first athlete. Why? Because he's motherfucking from Aotearoa. And this is the foundation of Aotearoa sport is that it's team first. Do your job. Team first means that we celebrate the team. We celebrate the team as a community. I think that's what Kiwis really love about sport is being part of a team, being part of a community, fitting into that team, fitting into that community. And Stephen Adams epitomizes that. So if we know bad matchup for Stephen Adams and also his professional sporting career is predicated on a team first mentality, I don't think it's a surprise that we have experienced what we have with Stephen Adams in this series two games down like everything just seems to have gone to script even though like we're ahead of the series we're like oh it could go either way there's a chance Stephen Adams like dominates in a weird way but also there are key indicators that this is going to be a not a bad series for Stephen Adams but a uh, limited st series for Stephen Adams. You're not going to see the best of Stephen Adams as a basketball player, but the last thing we know about Stephen Adams is that along with uh, many other illustrious Aotearoa athletes right now, Stephen Adams is a, like, he is a poster bloke for Aotearoa. And that means... In the big bright lights of the NBA, Stephen Adams is pure Aotearoa. So that means sometimes you're not going to play. When you're representing Aotearoa to that degree, sometimes it means you're just chilling. You're not necessarily the star of the show. Like Kiwis are a great, like Kiwi athleticism and Kiwi sports is again, team first, do your job, accept your role and celebrate those around you and i feel like stephen adams is just in alignment with what we know about stephen adams in the nba and that's all on display in this series all of which is to say wild card it's not that dramatic like i don't stephen adams isn't playing bad we know it's a bad matchup there's not going to be any drama for Stephen Adams playing three minutes and getting yanked because we know Stephen Adams is all good with that. We know Stephen Adams wants that in a sense of it's about the team. It's not about Stephen Adams, where a lot of the NBA coverage is about what's good for me. I'm the player. I want to play more minutes. I want to score more points. Like that's a very American mindset, but we're dealing with Aotearoa here. And everything I've seen from Stephen Adams in this series is pure Aotearoa sport. However, it doesn't come in the form of Stephen Adams having slam dunks, Stephen Adams shooting three-pointers, Stephen Adams grabbing rebounds and all these like intricate basketballing things. That's not where Stephen Adams is shining right now. I throw it to you, Wildcard. Curious about the fact that Stephen Adams is shining in the NBA playoffs in pure Aotearoa fashion. Shining in the NBA playoffs by not really playing in the NBA playoffs. Um, yeah, I mean, th th there's definitely some drama about if a guy like is starting and then gets subbed with foul trouble after three minutes and never takes the floor again, like doesn't come out at the start of the second half. I thought like they could have easily chucked him on when Cat went off with um, foul trouble midway through the second quarter. Like, okay, here's your opportunity, get him back out there, build him back up again. Um, but at the same time, like Brandon Clark and Xavier Tillman were playing really well to that point and got Memphis on a, on a bit of a roll. So it was like, well, why change things to, to shoehorn this guy in? Um, and like, there are moments throughout that, like you could have chucked him on at garbage time and, and helped his stats up a little bit just so there wouldn't be this talking point about how the dude played three minutes and then never played again. And um, seems unlikely that we see him start again uh, throughout this series just because they clearly have better matchups they can, um, you know, defensively put on Carl Anthony Towns, who who didn't have a good game in game two. Like, um, 
you can't really judge the first three minutes while Adams was out there because it's too short of a sample size to say that he was, you know, torching Adams. And then when they took Adams out and they immediately got better, like that was especially that game, because that was one of the worst first quarters of basketball I've ever seen in my life. It was just whistle after whistle after whistle. It was so dumb. A um, couple of reviews within the first, like I think it took over 40 minutes to play the first place. Like, you can maybe get to that stretch in the fourth quarter of a game where there's a lot of close game defining calls, but in the first quarter of a playoff game, when everyone's like, it's the playoffs, let them play is always what they say. And then it's like, nah, he's just whistle after whistle. Um, and Adams got caught up in that, but it turned out to maybe be a good thing for the Memphis Grizzlies. Cause um, despite what we can say about like, cause I, I could sit here and point out ways in which like, yeah, well maybe he slid, slides into the, the second unit now and, or maybe he gets, you know, minutes in certain matchups or whatever. Um, it's possible we don't see him again for the rest of the series, though. Like, that's a, also a possibility. Um, and the fact is, like, he's played, I think he got 24 minutes in the first game. Um, so played exactly half of it. But um, played three minutes in the second game. The minutes that he wasn't on the court for in both of those games, Memphis kind of torched minnesota like the the the, um the proof is in the pudding there it's like it's it doesn't have to be anything personal against stephen adams to say that like they were way better when he wasn't on the floor for whatever reason like for just matchups just um the way the game flowed um that's just kind of how it played out and I mean, you scroll through like NBA Twitter while that's happening and there's just a lot of like Stephen Adams is a bum, get him off the court. Like you know, they can't play him again. There's, um, let's trade him. Let's get rid of like this guy is washed up and just like very, very dumb of that, like dumb stuff. And that fits into that, um, that instant reaction category that you're talking about before where people have to make like, it's, it's always baffling to me how people can go from one extreme to the other just with the smallest amount of evidence, just like swing back and forth like a yo-yo. It's like, eh, maybe Mate, it's you're, just you're like the, a different you're the one situation. Scrolling, you're the one scrolling Twitter, so that's your fault. I'm just looking for the good stuff so I can find quotes and, and uh, you know, um, in video and stuff like that that, that paints a, a more accurate picture. And if I can't find it, I try to supply it. Because... Um, the weird thing is, like we, like I said, like we could go through different scenarios in which you could make this fit work, but it's like Stephen Adams is not the most important player in this basketball team. Like, there's three or four guys who are definitely ahead of him. He had a great regular season, um, you know, an important starter for them. But if the fit doesn't work in this series, you don't need to like shoehorn in your fourth or fifth most important guy. Like, you can just roll with what makes the top three guys perform better and. Um, they're not going to go out of their way to find ways to make Stephen Adams work if it wasn't working. Like it just might not be his series. And the weird thing is, you can you can look at that in a way of like because um, it is disappointing because we want to see him you know, racking up stats, playing well, influencing games, and and whatever. Um, but the weird thing is, as much as you can sit there and dissect that, the the guy who had the best reaction to it was Stephen Adams himself, who just like was you know benched early on in the game. Um, by the second half, he would have known that he probably wasn't going to get back out there again once he didn't start the second half. But there he is, like one of the first guys up and cheering every time someone makes a big play, supporting his dudes, being vocal in timeouts. Um, when the final buzzer went, he was the first guy on the court from the bench to, to get out there and celebrate. First thing he does, walks straight over to Xavier Tillman and gives him a big hug and congratulations. Like this is the dude who took all his minutes. This is the dude who, um, you know, who who effectively like, just jumped ahead of him on the on the picking chart for this series at least for this matchup and the first thing he does is like congratulate him and be like yeah bro well done like and then you get um you know coach jenkins afterwards asked about it and he's like well basically i said to steve look this 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 isn't really working i'm going to try something different and and adams just replied like yeah coach like whatever works whatever helps us win basketball games that's what we're all here for that's what we're all trying to achieve um if that's what you think is the best i'm, I'm all with it and then you get ja Morant talking in his press conference as well also asked about it. he's just like yes we've, we're a team that supports each other whether you're on the court or not like ja Morant missed a lot of games through the season so he's been in that um he's been in those shoes himself through injury rather than um being benched but you know Stephen adams is a veteran leader a guy who's um beloved within that unit and doesn't probably 
I would imagine he doesn't feel like an imposter syndrome kind of thing. I don't think he'll feel like, oh, I've been dropped. Therefore, I, I'm like, he's not going to feel what other people are saying about him. He knows his role in the team. He understands the situation and he just cops it on the chin and takes it with what, to be honest, you got to probably call like a, um, a, like, a, like a Zen mindful kind of attitude and just is like, okay, the situation has changed for me. I'm no longer doing this thing. How can I be the best player within this role? It's like being a great teammate, cheering guys on, making sure they know their specifics, what they need to achieve, um, and just helping the team win in a different way, you know? Um, and it was, yeah, it, it was a real town buzz game watching just like, so I'm spending the whole game just like one eye on the bench saying, okay, is he getting up? Is he walking over to the scorer's table? Are we going to, no, still got his, um, still got his trackies on, still got his like warm up shirt on. Okay, maybe not. Um, oh, he's not starting the second half. And, then as it gets away, you sort of realize the inevitability, which is kind of, a, yeah, a bit of a bit of a depressing moment as a fan trying to see this dude do well. But then um, the guy who teaches you the lesson about how to take something like that is the man himself, which is, I think, a pretty a pretty valuable thing and extremely valuable within the context of the Memphis Grizzlies. I got to imagine because they all acknowledged it. Everyone who was asked about it said well, what a great dude he was, how well he took it, and um, how he continues to be an influential and, and valuable teammate. So I think there's, yeah, there's plenty to learn from someone who can, who can call what other players probably would have felt like as a humiliation, like that they would have seen that as something else. People who have that sort of player first mentality that you mentioned, like a lot of guys wouldn't have taken that very well. He just copped it on the chin completely in stride and just like, right, we, the situation has changed, but we roll with it. I'm just going to be the best like teammate I can in a different way. Yeah, no shit, because Stephen Adams is the most New Zealand Aotearoa athlete on the biggest stage. The Memphis Grizzlies are the most Aotearoa team in the NBA. So all of it is just conspiring to celebrate Aotearoa. Because like you can like get into the nitty-gritty of why Stephen Adams is on the bench, but all I care about is that Stephen Adams is on the Aotearoa bench, and that is playing into the celebration of Aotearoa. Because it's not a Zen thing. It is a Zen thing. But in this context, it's an Aotearoa thing. Stephen Adams is just conducting himself how Aotearoa athletes conduct themselves. And that's because the Memphis Grizzlies are the Aotearoa NBA team. In the same way that the Brooklyn Nets kind of had that Aotearoa vibe when Sean Marks was the GM and Kenny Atkinson was the coach. And there are a lot of like... Um, you know, underground players, gritty, performing together, getting better and all that stuff. Now it's the Memphis Grizzlies. The Memphis Grizzlies are the pure Aotearoa team and everything is just conspiring to celebrate Aotearoa sports. So it's not even like a... Um, I'm just finding it fascinating how Stephen Adams in the NBA, everything he is doing represents Aotearoa sport to the fullest. And also, I mean, fuck, it's two games into a seven game series and there might be two, three, maybe four more of these series. So it's not like there's a lack of opportunity for any, like, I don't know. Everyone seems to be uh, dealing in um, really instant reactions to some of the NBA stuff. And it's just like, bro, there's plenty of opportunity for Steve Adams to shine on, a, on the, as in a basketball sense, but there's also, he is shining right now in an Aotearoa sporting sense. And I just feel like, everything's falling that way for Aotearoa to be represented in the fullest, as opposed to like Stephen Adams doing heaps of flashy shit that everyone loves. And then there's lots of hype. No, this is an Aotearoa matter. This is an Aotearoa sporting matter that is on display. And it's not just Stephen Adams, the Memphis Grizzlies as a team, as an organization are very much uh, like they could just come to Aotearoa. I'd say that like Aotearoa Grizzlies, is not said lightly. Let me just say that. Memphis well, is the Memphis is the New Zealand of um, America. So <laughs> that kind uh, of thing. No, the Grizzlies are the team. The like, Grizzlies uh, are that. No that, American that, town is related to New Zealand in any way, shape, or form. Memphis has some parallels. I, I won't no, say Hawaii. a direct thing, but there's some parallels. Um, yeah. Cool. High cultural oh. value. Um, you know, punch above their weight. Similar population. Those kind of things. You know, it's just um working class value kind of town as well is there's some stuff there's, yeah but nothing like uh, hawaii let's be honest um okay. <laughs> last sunday wildcard 
terrible Sunday of Aotearoa sport. Um, I can kind of do my best to flip around the Stephen Adams stuff into a glorious Aotearoa sporting moment. Can't quite do that with uh, the Wellington Phoenix and the Aotearoa Warriors, both suffering defeats on the same Sunday. There was a bit of a glorious Aotearoa moment with the Wellington Phoenix crowd celebrating their team back in Wellington. That was cool to see. Um, but both teams lost. And I've written about the Warriors, and I think there's some positive Warriors stuff, like just their effort and desire and mana and all that stuff. Uh, I'm not sure if that was evident. Like, yeah, of course, mana was evident for the Wellington Phoenix, but um, they also got smoked. Um, well, card now they play a game. Is this next game at Eden Park, I believe? Yes, on a Sunday yes, against the Western Sydney Wanderers. Don't have a time, thanks to the uh, terrible A-League website. Yes, there it is. 3.05 p.m. kickoff for the Wellington Phoenix against Western Sydney Wanderers. Western Sydney Wanderers are 10th on the A-League ladder, 25 points. Wellington Phoenix, despite losing every second game 4-0 or 5-0, they are currently 5th on 33 points. So they have 10 wins. Three draws, nine losses. Western Sydney Warrior, Warriors? Wanderers have six wins, seven draws, nine losses. Everything you've told me, so again, what do I know about the Wellington Phoenix right now? In the same way that I know Stephen Adams is a team first geezer, I know the Wellington Phoenix lose a game by 4-0, then they win the next game. You've told me that, we've read about that before. So are you expecting a Wellington Phoenix bounce back? Like, we'll get into the Warriors later on, but I'm not expecting a bounce back performance against the Storm. Like, I don't think that's realistic. Like, you just want to see a solid, consistent level of play, but it's not really a case of a bounce back. Are you expecting a bounce back from this Wellington Phoenix team? A, because they're facing a weaker team. B, because it's another game in Aotearoa and they probably want to fix up what happened in front of the Wellington crowd, um, which does make you wonder, surely, like, in this context, you want to have a win in Wellington and then save your 3-0, 4-0, 5-0 loss for the Eden Park game. Alternatively, you want to impress the Auckland crowd and you know the Wellington crowd's going to be there, ride or die. So respect to them. Get up to Auckland. You want to put on a show. You want to um, maybe tap into a different market as we've seen in the past as well. So I don't know. Are you expecting a bounce back? Why are you expecting a bounce back? Or are we seeing like an end of season decline? Like what's doing here with the Wellington Phoenix? Um, definitely experience, uh, expecting a bounce back. I'm hoping for a win, but definitely a bounce back. I mean, they've, I think that was the sixth time that they've lost by four goals or more to nil um, this season, which is incredible because that had never happened in his first two seasons as the, as the manager. Um, they never lost 4-0 before, and then suddenly it's happened like um, six times in one season, and once was a 5-0 and once was a 6-0. But... Um, Three of the five times so far, their game immediately afterwards, they've won. So like, more often than not, they do win after they get thrashed. Like they do uh, recalibrate and then come back with a much better performance. Um, and yeah, we'll be four out of six if they can get a win. And what is a, definitely a more favorable matchup. We're talking about matchups with Stephen Adams, matchups with the Wellington Phoenix. Western Sydney Wanderers is a much better one for them than Central Coast too. Um, kind of embody a lot of the struggles of, that the Phoenix have had um, on the pitch this season. Cause like as wild as their results appear and they are completely bonkers when you go on like six, no loss, five, no loss, then a couple wins in a row and then you lose four nil again. And then maybe they'll win again on the weekend. Like that's crazy. That's all over the place. Um, but it's, if you look into sort of why, and I just wrote an article kind of about this, like why are they all over the place? It's kind of like, it stems from simple little, um, you know, could go either way factors. And um, there's a stat that's been doing the rounds about how when they've conceded the first goal, which has happened nine times in their 22 games so far, when they've conceded the first goal, they've lost all nine times. When they score the first goal, 
they've drawn three times and won what did I say? I think nine times or something like that as well. So it's like unbeaten when they score the first goal, usually winning haven't have lost every single game when they score, when they concede the first goal. And like that game against central coast, they started really well. First 25 minutes, they were the better team. They were well on top creating chances. David ball has a great one is unable to finish, um, you know, shots saved. And then Mariners basically got the other end and score on the counter attack. And when the Phoenix concede the first goal, like this isn't there's there's a little bit of a mentality thing about here because you look at a young team, lots of injuries at the moment are forcing academy players into bigger roles than they would have been expecting this early in their development, um, and you get like more extreme fluctuations with younger players who are going to react more emotionally to situations and be a bit more impatient when they go behind and things like that, take more risks and um, maybe make silly mistakes now and then. Like that that comes with the territory and it's something that was kind of forced upon them by just the injury crisis they're going through. Um, but it's well, not just that. That's yeah, go why, on. That, that's why you don't want a team featuring a lot of young players for a World Cup. Exactly. <laughs> that's that is exactly true. And when you do have young guys pro- coming through, you want them to be like just fitting in within an existing spine core of a team with a lot of veteran leaders who can show them the way on the pitch as it's going on. Um, like it's not a coincidence. Finn Sermon's a, a young guy who's having, you know, a decent look and he's, he's got mistakes in him. Obviously he's a teenage center back, but um, he's, I, you know, he's further ahead than I thought he was as a player. And I've been a big fan of him watching him for the, for the wee Knicks. Not a surprise. He's doing that next to Scott Wooden, who's an experienced leader who can help guide him through and things like that. Like that's, that's like, seriously accelerating um his development i would say um but those are like those are little things that happen with it like this that's a situation that wellington phoenix accord and those young players are also winning games like they're not just always getting blown out and yes the squad depth as well is a big factor because a lot of the like they lost five nil to central coast away when they played them a couple weeks ago lost four nil at home when they played them here um nine nil overall i think five of those nine goals were scored in the last half hour of those two games so fatigue late in games young players seeing the result is gone and maybe um dropping their standards a little bit like things like that are happening and that some of these results the big losses that they're having are not actually as bad as they seem it's just like teams are scoring consolation like not even consolation goals whatever the opposite of that is um they're scoring like stoppage time goals to turn a three nil into a four nil and things like that and making it look worse than it really is um but i think the reason the Phoenix struggle so much when they concede first is because they are at their heart um, and injuries have forced them to kind of be this specifically. Like they don't have as much flexibility as they've had at other times. They Gary Hooper available is a different story, like a target man striker, hold the ball up, bring others into play, finish off chances. Um, you know, you can pump crosses in towards him and he's, he's going to be a good op- like a guy who can score from those kind of scenarios. So like, um, that would change things, but Gary Hooper's only started six games all season, and four of them were the first four games of the of the campaign. So um, he's kind of been a non-factor since then. Not the same thing. They don't have the depth to be able to bring on like um, game-changing subs midway through games. So when things start to get away from them, they can't really alter the course of the game like that. Um, but like most of all, is that they are that counter-attacking team, and when they go behind other teams don't need to take risks to break them down. They can sit deeper. The defensive line is suddenly 10 meters further, closer to their own goal. The Phoenix have less um, less space to work in and the space that they do have is with defenders in front of them. So it's just harder to get through, harder to break them down. And the Mariners kind of did that to perfection. It's like they score the first goal on the break, like a nice runaway kind of um, strike from them, but it came completely against the run of play. But from that point on, all they got to do is be like solid, um, sturdy like uh organized at the back and just have a couple quick guys up front and then when the phoenix overcommit, you hit them and then pounce them and like score again and, and double the lead and then force them into making more mistakes and and um being even more reckless and, and taking risks and stuff like that and then you score again because of that like that's that's how these games have gotten out of hand for them when they've gone behind that's why they're getting thrashed in these games where they can see the first goal rather than just losing one nil two one sort of thing um and it's just kind of the team that they are. Like the, the irony of this all is that their most consistent forward in terms of like production so far this season. I mean, Gael Sandoval has had the higher levels, um, but he's also had some pretty dud games. And like recently, he's had to play a lot in midfield where he's not really able to influence the attack as much as he normally would. 
most consistent forward throughout this period has been Joshua Soteria, who is notoriously inconsistent himself. Like, and they, they've just got into this thing where the team is so inconsistent that, like, you know, radio waves lining up. It's like um, they've their inconsistencies have, have perfectly aligned with Joshua Soteria's inconsistencies to where he's now consistent. Like, it's, it's what's happening, apparently. But, like, more than anyone, he is a player who thrives on running in behind the defensive line. The deeper the defensive line is, the less space there is to run into. The more perfect a pass has to be in order to get, like for him to be able to get to it before a defender gets back and before a goalkeeper goalkey becomes forward. Like, um, he basically isn't so much of a factor when that happens. So when the team gets, when, like when the Phoenix are able to score first and force other teams to come at them and play higher and then, you know, he's an absolute weapon. It's not the same when it's going the other way. And guys like David Ball, Reno Piscopo, they're the same. Like they want to play in space. They want to play at a bit of like speed and um, they want to be running with the ball and stuff like this. And you just can't do that when there's like three defenders right in front of you in your vicinity. So that's kind of why I think the Phoenix, it's, it's a weird one because you don't normally see this kind of fluctuation of results, but I kind of think there's that simple answer to it. It's just the team that they are and the team that like, they don't have a plan B right now because plan B is injured. They, they only have plan A. So when plan A works, they're really good. When plan A doesn't work, there's kind of no alternative and they tend to lose 4-0. Like it's, it's kind of the way that the last couple months have gone for them. But, um, you know, they're, what are they, fourth place? I think they'll go third if they can win their game in hand against Adelaide. Like, then there's a winnable contest against Western Sydney Wanderers as well, the kind of game that they will enjoy, like stylistically do match up against them better. And I mean, they only need a couple more. Like I think they have four games left. Let's say two of them are four nil defeats. Two of them are wins. Well, that's probably going to get them like fourth place or something like that. You know, that's, that's going to get them a home semifinal. If they can have a couple more of those games where they do score first and win games, like they can afford to be all over the place. Um, it's not like they're, you know, Manchester City, Liverpool going head to head in a title battle where any one slip up is suddenly the end of your season. Like this is, this is the Phoenix are where they are. And despite everything, like a couple more of those games where things click and they score the first goal and then they like go on to get those three pointers. Like they're going to achieve what they've set out to achieve, make the finals and put themselves in a good opportunity to hopefully win a finals game as well. Like it's kind of an incredible place for them to be in despite everything when you think about it. They are fifth on the ladder. Um, yeah, big week fifth for, trying to go fourth, yeah. Big week for Scott Wooten, not Wooden, as I Googled, but Wooten. Um, big shout out in the variety show for you. Got to mention here as well. My question to you, Wildcard, what age was Scott Wooten when he made his under-18 Uh, debut for Liverpool. Liverpool or Manchester United? I thought it was at Manchester United. Yeah, it was at Liverpool before then. Okay, there you go. Um, I think that, <laughs> that did upset both sides. Um, I, I, I don't know. If, if you're asking me the question, I'm guessing he must have been pretty young. I think there are limits. Like, you can't play as, like, a 12-year-old. So I'll say, like, 14 or something. He was 14. Joined the Liverpool go. Academy at 13 and then uh, did play, did make his debut, senior debut. What game did Scott Wooten make his Manchester United senior debut? Um, I know this because I remember looking it up when he played. I think it was a Champions League game, wasn't it? Um, I can't remember who it was against, though. It was. I think the, they might have lost it. It was the Gary Neville testimonial game in 2011. So shout okay. out to Scott. Well, that, that doesn't quite count. Testimonial. Yeah, I'm just but, asking you. I'm just yeah. having a bit of fun here. Don't worry. I'm not, uh, I'm not grilling your, your historical Manchester United <laughs> knowledge. Like, don't get insecure. Good, about good it. stat, okay. though. Like, good, yeah. So shout out to Scott Wooten. He's, uh, he's here. He's playing for the Wellington Phoenix, and he's doing some good stuff, apparently, according to yourself, their wild card. What are some, like, key... Like if the Wellington Phoenix, they apart from the trends you have uh, illuminated there, what are some like footballing elements that you're looking for against the Western Sydney Wanderers this weekend? And just some like key indicators of the Wellington Phoenix playing a lot better. Is it more? Is it like a case of the same stuff that you've highlighted in the trends, like them being a counter 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 attacking team, finding space and behind all that shit? 
or are you looking for like some fresh wrinkles as they enter the back end of the season, chasing more consistent performances? Well, definitely like first and foremost is that the, the same old yarns, like if there's only plan A, then you have to look to plan A, right? <laughs> let's see the, let's see the counterattacking stuff. Let's see them trying to get it's like some penetration as they say, like but in behind the defensive line and attacking that speed and those kind of things, transitional moments, win the ball, get out on attack. Just quickly, um, uh, are you like, is this a case of the Wellington Phoenix are a counterattacking team? Is that their like, identity or is it just a small part of their game plan i think all firing on all cylinders it would be um it would still be the main part of their game plan but it certainly wouldn't be the only part of their game plan i think at the moment just with all the injuries that they've got the people they have available the sort of lack of options on the bench um gary hooper being a non-factor for the majority of the season like he as i said before he would change things if you'd had someone like that who could be a bit more of an anchor up front um but they don't and and so as it is kind of like they've been forced into where like this is the one thing that's left for them that they're really good at um there's the other thing like they were shaping up to be a really good set piece team for a while there when clayton lewis was taking corner kicks and free kicks but he's currently injured so it's another one that's current, like not an option at the moment, as much of an option at least. Um, but hopefully he'll be back before the season is over and, and resume where he left off. But like there's, there's other ways that they can play, and there's other ways they would be playing. Um, ideally, you'd get you'd be seeing um, more production from the the fullbacks getting overlaps and stuff as well. Um, but just as it is right now, like everything's just been paired back to the basics and the basics for the Phoenix is that counterattack and identity. So that's more or less why, more or less why they're at that, um, in that position. Uh, just like as to the other stuff to look for, I think the main thing is the formation. Like if he loves his four, two, 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 but he's gone away from that to play a back three, just because again, like personnel that's available. Um, when you have, so few midfield options that you're having to put a winger in midfield just to fill things out one way to help like to help that lot out is to have an extra defender behind them but also to play with wing backs where you can condense what the midfield needs to do because you sort of have that it's almost like a three four three kind of shape um wing backs almost playing level with the midfielders which just means that the midfielders don't get dragged so wide they can hold that that middle area of the park um whether he sticks with that though because he started with the with the three at the back and it did really well against perth but it was definitely a reluctant thing um that he didn't quite want to stick with um you saw him uh or was it brisbane i think it might have been the brisbane game they did that and then against perth he started with it but then they were just perth was sitting so deep and defending them so um so like um yeah well <laughs> de defending them so deep basically that all they were doing was passing the ball around the back line and they needed more options further forward. So he switched it up and went, chucked Tim Payne into the midfield and went back to his back four. Um, did the same thing against Central Coast. We start with the back three, but then at halftime, chuck an extra midfielder in there because they were losing 1-0 at that point. Um, Payne again moves up into midfield and then let's, let's change the shape that way. So um, I... I would be very interested to see if he sticks with that, considering he's he did it like he didn't want to change the formation initially. He did it reluctantly, and he has been quite quick within games to go away from it. I, I would be a little bit surprised if they stick with that against a team they're probably hoping to be able to dominate the ball against anyway. So that is a that is a, definitely a factor to look at. Um, and on top of that, I mean, let's let's hopefully see James McGarry. James McGarry has a habit of starting games at left back really well. And then you're just like 15 minutes of the game being like, yeah, he's looking good. He's getting forward. He's getting crosses into the box. He's taking on his man. And then he doesn't really do a lot for the rest of the game. Like he's, I've noticed that in, a, in a, quite a lot of his performances for the Phoenix. Hopefully we can get something like just, you know, more impact from him deeper into the match because he really is someone who I think they could, um, who, who could really offer them a different outlet there, which would really help. Um, and then also, I wonder if maybe Ben Wayne might start ahead of Soterio. I think probably not because of this particular game against Western Sydney. I think they might still like the idea of Soterio getting in behind. Um, but Ben Wayne is someone who does play a little bit differently. He's not necessarily going to run in behind. He will drop in and try to hold the ball up a bit more. So um, that would be another different aspect to how they might play. But um, 
yeah, we'll see a lot of those answers. We'll we'll know as soon as we see the team sheet. It was just to, we won't know before then. Another trivia question here. 16 NRL teams, where do the Warriors rank for offloads this season? So I'm trying to think if I can remember them doing a heap of offloads or not many, because that question could be leading either way. Um, well, obviously, you're uh, not going to like visually, you don't have a photographic memory of every offload. So just give me a follow. Not every offload. I'm just trying to think if it was a, a major aspect of how they were playing. And I, I can't I can't think of whether it is or not. So I'm going to... I'm going to take the cop-out answer and say eighth. Fifteenth. Right in the middle. Fifteenth. So only one team offloads the ball less than the Warriors, and that is the Brisbane a Broncos. So we got the Warriors versus Storm uh, Monday evening. We always like to uh, get into these fixtures and chuck on the Kiwi NRL goggles for the other team just to confine the rugby league discussion. And my Melbourne Storm vibe here is just enjoying this group of Storm Kiwi NRL, like this Kiwi NRL Storm team, because next season, both Bromwich's brothers are going to Redcliffe and Brandon Smith's going to the Roosters. So, and we also have this uh, trend that the Melbourne Storm their Kiwi NRL numbers in the in their system have decreased in the recent years as well. You do have uh, Will Warbrook, um, someone with illustrious footy history in Aotearoa. Funky, you no, know, I wrote about this last week, and because of the Melbourne Storm here, Warbrook isn't actually named in the extended squad, so he must be injured. So th his history is the Warbrook Fano. Um, and there were a bunch of brothers, I think there were five of them, who way back in the day, like early 1900s or so, they formed, they basically started the All Blacks in a way. They toured Europe and they had, they performed haka, they wore the black jerseys with the silver fern, they played an exciting brand of footy, which is interesting because that like if you're talking about All Blacks identity, it's rooted in such historical markers. Um, and I think they were named the, like the native New Zealand team or something like that. Obviously, we're dealing with some, uh, the way things were. Yep. And, they, and, and they toured Europe. On the way back, they toured Australia. So they were playing rugby union. On their way back, they stopped off in Australia. They played, I think they played some rugby league games. In Australia, but they also played VFL footy in Melbourne against VFL teams, which is Victorian Football League, which is basically AFL footy. <laughs> so this rugby union team from Aotearoa, they went to England, they played some games there, came back to through Australia, they played rugby league against rugby league teams in Australia, and they played AFL against AFL teams. Now Will Warbrick warbrick I always like say that name funny he is currently with the melbourne storm in victoria where afl is played in aotearoa will warbrick played afl footy at a junior level in aotearoa so that's a weird uh little connection there obviously immense family whanau history but also dabbles in a bit of afl footy as well but he's not named this week but they do have him in their team and there are some other you know sporadic kiwi nrl individuals um in the storm system however next season we might only be dealing with jerome hughes and nelson asofa solomona as well as remus smith who was born and raised in australia now that would be interesting because both jerome hughes and asofa solomona are both from wellington so then you get a situation where the kiwi nrl storm become the Wellington Storm in the same way we have the Aotearoa Grizzlies. So that's quite interesting. But we need to appreciate this group of Storm players together because I think they are an exceptional group and concentration of Kiwi NRL talent. Also ponder, because the Storm, in my lifetime, I've got the Storm as the best Kiwi NRL club over the past 20 years, 25 years. They're not the best Kiwi NRL club right now. That, of course, goes to the Roosters. 
but the storm have had an immense historical connection to Aotearoa, going back to, uh, you know, the, the Stephen Kearney's, the David Kidwell's, like all those geezers, Adam Blair, Tohu Harris, like they've been a fantastic club recruiting talent from Aotearoa. Um, so big it up to them. Now moving forward, I'm curious what's going to happen because they just don't have the same Kiwi NRL depth in their club. So I'm curious to see how that plays out. Coming up against the Warriors, I'm curious to see what happens here because I do think there's a chance the Warriors can win this. They, If they play their best and get a lot of impact from their bench, guys like Bunty Foa, Aaron Pena, Eliasaka Toa, the Storm have some very good players, but in the Storm fashion, they got some uh, dudes I've never heard of on their bench and in their wider squad. So that's always a good, it's a great thing for the Storm, but I think there's a chance the Warriors can um, snare an upset win. Same vibe as the Roosters game. Like if the Roosters were slightly off their game last week and if the Warriors were at their best, I think the Warriors can win that game, could have won that game. Um, if the Storm is slightly off this week, I think the Warriors can also um, give them a good challenge. So that's going to be interesting. Matt Lodge returns for the Warriors, which is going to be a boost for their uh, up the guts running. And then everything else is fairly stock standard for the Warriors. Coming off like Sean Johnson didn't have his best defensive game last week, fell off a big tackle for a try. I think he missed four tackles as well. Everyone was a bit not at their best and they still showed up and put in a good effort. So I think there's a chance for the Warriors to upset the Storm. More than you would have said ahead of the Roosters game or less than you would have said ahead of the Roosters game? I suppose that comes in the context of having seen them put up a pretty like solid battling performance. Not, not quite enough to topple the Roosters. I mean... They can like the team ha can have a little bit of a moan and request a um, uh, what do you call it like a, an explanation from the referees, but ultimately that very rarely actually decides uh, matches um, in the way that people like to portray it as. Um, the um, but yeah, I'll just chuck it back to you with that question. Like, would you say it's like a a better vibe at going into the storm than roosters or less so? That's interesting because I think what happens against the Roosters sets up what's this weekend's game. Because mm. as I noted yeah. in the Diary of a Warriors fan yarn, and as I, I think I would have said this in the Variety Show as well, also said in the email of the Warriors, the Roosters get, did a great defensive job on the Warriors and restricted their post-contact meters. They had the lowest average set distance of the season for the Warriors across six games. And the Roosters basically, I was, I was checking it because obviously, you know, when the Warriors play, it looks like the other team's offside every play the ball. <laughs> like in my lifetime, that has been a common like thread. Oh, the other team's offside. They're always offside. And then suddenly you call the Warriors offside and it's like, oh, and you lose the plot. Um, that was before I realized the Warriors were cursed and now I can just deal with it in a zen um you know, Matt in a Zen state. But the what the Roosters, it looked like they were like 11 meters back from the play the ball. Because like, shout out to NRL, all the full games are on the NRL YouTube page, like a couple of days after. So I watched that game back on the YouTube and the Roosters were like 11, 12 meters back from the play the ball. So they weren't offside. But we know the Roosters are well coached. We, and we know the Storm are well coached. So it's a similar, it's a common thread there. But the Roosters, great line speed, but it's like they come up in a arrow shape. And the point of that arrow is rushing forward to where they, they as the defense, have identified the ball is going to go. So whether it's like one pass off the ruck, well, then that arrow becomes a bit more blunt and it's like two or three dudes rushing up to meet the prop or the or Adam Fenua Blake, one pass off the ruck. But if the what the Warriors like to do, and this happened a few times at the start of the game, is they'll go 
one big pass to Sean Johnson, and then Sean Johnson passes to Dallin Watini Zalesniak. Now, the Roosters, they know that Sean Johnson isn't going to run the ball. They know that Sean Johnson is just going to pass it to Watini Zalesniak. So they just get their arrow-shaped defensive formation, and the point of that arrow is right there to meet Watine Zalesniak. And that is fantastic coaching because you're coaching the players, like this is what we're going to do, but also you've coached the players enough to be able to identify where the ball is going to end up and execute that with your communication, your energy and all that stuff. And that nullified a lot of the Warriors running, which is why they had their lowest post-contact meters and average set distance of the season coming into the Storm game, that is something the Storm could do because the Storm have the best coach ever in Craig Bellamy and they are one of the best rugby league teams, clubs ever. So they can do that. Two things though. I don't think the Warriors are going to, because if good coaching from the Warriors and I don't know, I'll plant the seed and say that there are examples of good coaching in the Warriors. Like players have got better come in the Warriors NRL system. And that's an example of good coaching. Another example of good coaching would be subtle variations adjusting from that Roosters defense. Because they only had three dummy half runs against the Roosters. And also a lack of offloading doesn't help. Like if, you're, if you've got 10 dummy half runs and 15 offloads, I think that's a good way to counter rushing defense but the Warriors had three dummy half runs and we know they are 15th in offloads so that is not going to help against rushing defense every um I think you had tallies like so one dummy half run for 12 meters another dummy half run for eight meters another dummy half run for 10 meters so you know that's roughly nine meters per dummy half run that's a good way to counter rushing defense so they might do more of that or they might just change some of their setups and have a few more options to work with so that the defense can't load up on identifying one sole ball carrier load up on him if you've got two options like if you've got one option either side of the ruck that's going to help if you've got two options either side of the ruck helps even further so there's stuff the warriors can do to counter what the Storm saw the Roosters do, if that makes sense. Also, I don't think the Storm's depth in their forwards is as good as the Roosters. So I'm not sure if like guys like Trent Loriero, Tepai Maoroa, um, they're, they're carrying Brandon Smith and Tyron Wishart, who I think is a hooker on their bench as well. So I don't think the Storm are going to be able to sustain what the Roosters did. Because the Roosters forward pack, like, you, Angus Crichton is still one of the most underrated forwards in the game. You've got dudes on their bench as well. Lindsay Collins, Wade Air Hargraves, Victor Radley. Um, of course, Jesse Bromwich, Manuel Marlins Jr., Kenny Bromwich, Manuel Marlins Jr., Osofa Solomona, I think he's an upper heart Tiger Jr., like, Brandon Smith, the Waiheke Ram. All those dudes are exceptional forwards, but I think the entirety of the Roosters forward pack is better equipped to do what they did. Um, and I don't think the Storm are as equipped to do what the Roosters did. Of course, the Storm can just blow away the Warriors with Pappenhausen, Munster, Hughes, Grant, Smith, like all those dudes. So there's other challenges, but I'm curious to see how the Warriors respond to what the Roosters did coming into the Storm game. And all of my like judgments, to get to your question, if I can remember it correctly, because I've just spun a big yarn, I it kind of depends just what the Storm... If the Storm is slightly off their game, the Warriors have a chance. Because the Roosters were well and truly off their game with the footy against the Warriors, and the Warriors had a chance. But if the Storm show up, as we've seen many times, whether it be an Anzac Day fixture or any other game, if the Storm show up and they are 8 out of 10, 9 out of 10, 10 out of 10, no contest. Um, so I'm just curious, like, that package of what happens, 
because I view it in like uh, in stints of games. We had the three easier games. Now we've got these two games, Roosters versus and Storm. So I'm kind of viewing it through that lens. You've got two games here to see what the Warriors are really about. They show good mana, good effort against the Roosters, which is encouraging. And it's kind of like, can they repeat that against another really good team? And then can they show footy improvements as well? Yeah, I um, I didn't see a heap of the game against the Roosters uh, live because it was on at the same time as the Wellington Phoenix. So I was they well they overlapped. I think there was like the the first the second half of the Phoenix and the first half of the Warriors were on at the same time. Um, so I didn't see a a heap of it, but um, from what I did see, and then especially from what you've just said there. It, it feels a little bit more like if they were going to get one of these games, it was probably the Roosters game because they they're up against a team that um, did limit them like extremely well in terms of like the Roosters defense. But the Warriors seem to be the kind of team that if, if you had to choose between a shootout or a, like a low scoring slugfest, I think they'd probably prefer the um the, the low scoring slugfest just because they maybe aren't as like efficient at putting away all of their chances as they would otherwise. Um, and the storm are more likely to give you a bit of a, uh, a shootout. And I don't, I don't see them being able to keep up with that. But at the same time, I also don't really know that this is a game that's necessarily about the result as much as it is about the performance. And they, they didn't beat the roosters, but they put up a pretty solid performance and one that definitely was better than most people would have expected of them. And that's why the three wins in a row before that were really important because it buys you that time. It buys you that, um, that freedom to be able to be like, well, we're not going out here to lose. Like we're, we're not, we're not trying to tank these games or anything like that, but we understand that we're the underdogs and we understand that we can keep this game in context and be like, well, if we do lose, let's at least, hit some standards and and just keep on building like the framework of what this Warriors team is trying to be this season. So it's a, I mean, it's a, it's a tough one, isn't it? Where you go from really, um, I mean, it's the three games in a row that they won, but really like there was Dragons and, and Titans or I think Dragons and Titans the first two, wasn't it? Where they lost, but, um, you know, were close games that they might have won if they'd been a little bit more efficient in a couple of areas. So like, to be honest, it wasn't just the first three. It's the first five games were all quite fortunate matchups, and they came out of that with a winning record, which is you know good solid. It's just, for the team that they are and the place that they are. That's about what you would be hoping for. Um, if they were four and one, they'd be even better. But that's you know so you know, so it goes. Um, average teams are going to lose close games sometimes against teams of a similar level, and that happened against the against the Titans game in particular. Um, but like, yeah, I mean. They, they are they are where they are and then to go from those like five relatively like fortunate kind of matchups where you just get that alignment of um decent either close games or one or two where they're actually you know able to comfortably be like the better team there um and then go to play the two like dynastic teams of the last decade <laughs> roosters and storm back to back is is a rough one like that's it's a that's a toughie. That's a um, like quirk of the fixture list that isn't particularly favorable, but it's a nice time to be able to see where they're at to play those games after three wins in a row. So it's, um, you know, it's glass half full or glass half empty. If you look at the half full, like this is, this is a nice little gauge, like these two games in a row, nice little gauge for the Warriors to see like how the, how the Nathan Brown project is coming along and that kind of thing. Right. Correct. It's also probably worthy to highlight that I don't think the Warriors, I can't remember an Anzac Day game at Mount Smart. No. So like it's no, it's all honkadori for people to talk about the Warriors' record versus the Storm on Anzac Day, but all those games are in Melbourne. Yeah, the all Storm the way. Don't games. really lose any game in Melbourne. So like on top, like we already know the yarn. The Warriors have no home field advantage. We saw last round, especially like you go to Brookvale, it's packed out. The Panthers game, packed out stadium. Uh, the, the Dragons game against the Knights, frothing crowd. The Warriors have none of that. And they always play Anzac Day in Melbourne. So it's a bit of a rough deal. But 
going back to that Roosters game, I don't think this is going to happen again. So this is going to be encouraging, I believe. No Warriors player hit the 10 meter per run mark. No, not one, right? But Adam Fanua Blake was still the best player on the field for the Warriors. He was fantastic, but he was below his best. 16 runs for 146 meters. I'm going to do one last trivia here, Wildcard. I don't expect you to like have any rational. In all my trivia cases, Good. I'm Takes not the pressure off. Yeah, I'm not expecting you to have a rational argument for your answer. Just throw whatever comes to mind. I want the total number of runs and the total meters for Josh Curran. Let me give you his minutes played. 69 minutes played. And one more asterisk. This goes back to the Warriors. Like, no player had 10 meters per run. Um, various players were slightly off. Reese Walsh had a couple of errors. He was really good, lively, but also starting the second half, booting it out, not a good start. Like, those things were happening. Another thing that happened, Josh Curran blatantly injured, really trying to play. So credit to him. This is not a negative. So I'm kind of already skewing your answer in one direction. Total number of runs, total number of meters. What do you reckon? Let's go. Uh, let's, let's go 10 runs for 75 meters. Ooh. So that's 7.5 meters per run. The answer is 16 runs for 90 meters which comes out at 5.62 meters per yeah. run. okay so that he didn't run backwards at any point did he but <laughs> yeah no, that, one but, those ones. that's not happening again and i think some of the warriors individual performances and their collective performance i can't see them doing what they did last week again now the storm they might be able to because what do the storm do well they identify the strength of the other team they take it away so the storm might be able to do a job on Fanua blake but you've also got matt lodge coming back into the team the storm might be able to do a do job on reese walsh but you've got some other options there chanel harris devita also has a left footer kicking game harris devita sean johnson also do playmaking the Storm might be able to limit the oomph for the Warriors forward pack. But we know the Warriors might want to do more dummy half running. Still got Cody Nakarima off the bench. Wade Egan's getting out of dummy half as well. So I don't think... Like, it was just a weird game last week against the Roosters. Like A lot of stuff like happened where you don't... like Josh Curran isn't going to do that again unless he's injured again. And if he's injured again maybe just get them off the field i don't know um but that was just a weird game against the roosters and i can't see individuals or the team serving up another not a bad game serving up another weird game like that's uh, i don't know how that happens so um yeah curious about how it goes not expecting a win because we know warriors play every anzac game in melbourne and they usually lose these games. So we just got to keep that in mind. Uh, but we keep rocking and rolling. Another round of footy, fun round of footy. And uh, there's no more <clears throat> under-18s for Redcliffe. That's all done. Um, Under-21s, we only have Ali Lia Tawa and Eric Va'afusuanga named. But of course, that could change for the game day. So we have to check in early next week. In reserve grade, just got Kinakepu named on the bench. But that could change as well. So another weekend of uh, Warriors footy. Storm game, footy every day of the weekend, as well as all the junior matters in Australia as well. Any closing thoughts, Wildcard? Well, just one throwing it back to the um, the Warbrook final. We 
you're talking about the thing because I looked it up before while you're talking about it. Is this the the 1888-89 New Zealand native football team that we're that we're talking about? Which is even older than I thought. When you said they were like the first team to do a hucker and and wear like the all black jersey kind of thing, um, I was picturing like early 1900s or something like that. It's actually 1888-89. And looking at it as well, like they appear to have played like over a hundred games on that tour. Like they went to they went to Britain and Ireland. They played some, um, I think, in in uh, New Zealand as well, and then a bunch of stuff in Australia. And you mentioned the Victorian rules football. It says as well they played two association football games. Is that right? Like they apparently played two just like soccer football matches against Australian clubs. I think by the look of it. So that seems like I'm assuming someone's already written that book. But it seems like a book worth reading, like just the incredible amount of stuff that seems to have happened on what was obviously an extremely long tour. I'm guessing, um, I don't know when it, if it says when they went away, but like <laughs> the 1889, 88 to 89 thing is probably not just one of those, like we were there in December and January, so it's crossing over two years. It sounds like they were probably away for quite a while. Um, and it also sounds like just an incredible bit of like, Aotearoa sporting history and it was it was uh Joseph Warbrick it says here who pretty much organized the thing as well so there you go I think there is uh some kind of short film made about it there's definitely a book um and I believe a lot of the All Blacks culture and identity stems from that tour and what the uh especially the Warbrick Fano did like some of the like the identity and all that stuff stems from there also you can like I think one of the brothers was like either he died in the eruption that destroyed the pink and white terraces or like he was like a rescue dude and like he, like there's there, there are they were heavily engaged in the uh local area as well as also being exceptional football players um, I think I also read because they're from like the Rotorua wider region and they went to school like in Pukekohe and they played like they would play rugby in Auckland and I don't know I don't even know how all that shit happened and to finish to bring things together I think they had a Pakia father and the daughter of a Maori chief were the parents so, I don't know. We hear a lot of bad shit about the way relations were and the way relations are now, but you can also just flip it in a positive sense and be like, well, those people came together and gave us a fantastic, you know, route to learn about Aotearoa's sporting history as well. So we can also be grateful for how these things come together, grateful that Māori culture is still alive and well and thriving, grateful that that situation birth because if you think right well, here's a great place to finish world cup we believe Aotearoa is the greatest sporting nation in the world right now based on what we just explained decent case to be made that Aotearoa was also the best sporting nation in 1888 thanks to those lads as well like there would have been I'd say less than a million people in Aotearoa at that time. But they still, there was still enough sporting talent for a group of rugby players to play rugby, AFL, rugby league. And are you sure that association thing is soccer? Well, that's normally what association football means. I, I don't know where to find the um, thing. There were only two games against, it seems to be Australian club. So it might've just been like a, a less than official type thing, but it seems to be. So all of that happened back in 1888. So those are the roots of Aotearoa's sporting excellence, you know, like these roots run deep and I don't think it's any surprise that Aotearoa is the best sporting nation in the world right now. And you can apply like all sorts of different modern examples that stem from the example set by those people um, back in the day. Those are the roots. It also seems that they won like, like 107 um, rugby games that they played 
78 wins, six draws, 23 losses. Like they won a whole lot more than they lost, which is, and two of the players from that squad went on to captain the uh, New Zealand national rugby team, according to this as well. So um, there you go. <laughs> the, the influence runs extremely deep from that one. Aotearoa is the best sporting nation in the world. Aotearoa was the best sporting nation in the world. Get with it. Kia kaha. As was, always has been. Stay beautiful. Raise your mana. Māori ora. Chur, chur.